Hi, I'm Cherie Burton. Welcome to Managing Mood, Mind, and Sleep, part of our Reinventing Healthcare Continuing Education series. How many of you would like to take control of your mood, your mind, and your sleep? There are many critical unmet needs, nutritionally and biochemically, that we're facing today that maybe we didn't necessarily face a century ago or even a decade ago. A big part of that are dietary deficiencies. We're not actually replacing what we use up chemically. When a body's critical needs are not being met, it will create a biochemical imbalance within the body, which will automatically create a negative mood state. Why is that? What is happening? Why so much emotional distress? Dietary deficiencies. There's a lot of inadequate consumption happening within our diets, things that are missing, and the, our body chemistry is not able to absorb and uptake and utilize the nutrition that we do take in, what little there is. Lifestyle. Many lifestyle imbalances and both dietary and lifestyle toxicity. That's one thing that they didn't teach me when I was getting my psychology degree about the impact that environmental toxicity and nutritional toxicity or lack thereof contributes to some of these developmental disorders and mood disorders. Substance abuse, very prevalent in our society today. We're gonna to talk about why later. Also imbalanced hormones. A lot of times that will contribute to diminished mood or significant mood problems. And also the big one, money. When you have a health issue, especially related to one of these mood, mind, and sleep imbalances, you tend to seek out a lot of help, and that can be very draining on your budget. Along these lines, sometimes you don't have the budget, if you will, within your chemical reserves of your body to meet life's challenges. So there can be a definite deficit there. And also, your DNA, your genetic inheritance. My family has a very substantial history of mental illness. So we were actually part of a large clinical study to look at genetic markers that factored into mental illness and depression. So this is something that rings very true for me and hits very close to home because I've seen many family members suffer with depression and have seen firsthand how they're trying to find that right balance biochemically and going to other sources to find it outside of natural means. We're gonna focus more on natural means today and how we can take control of our health our biochemical and our nutritional health to achieve that optimum mood state. Now there's a difference between a false mood state and a true mood state. When it's something, when you know you're in a false mood state, it's when your symptoms basically aren't going away. Something's not being healed. That broken heart is not mending, you're not being able to get past your issue. It's just not healing. Also, no matter how much prayer, meditation, solace, stillness, what have you that you do in processing, it just feels like it's not going away. When you are in a justifiably true mood state, typically those symptoms are going to pass. You're going to be able to assimilate all of those experiences and let them work through your body and process through them. Now, a true emotional state, some people equate that with weakness, but actually it's strength. When you're able to ground yourself in your body and let those emotions pass through you, it's very healthy. So even when you have a repressed emotion, you can actually become relieved of that repressed emotion by being in a true mood state. So they do serve a purpose. True moods serve a purpose. Grief, loss, fear, all of those things that we normally constitute as a negative emotion are actually true emotions. When you are feeling something and it's starting to rise to here and you can feel it in your throat or you actually feel the biochemical a reaction in your body happening with that mood surfacing, you can do one of two things. You can let it flow through you and surface, or you can actually repress it, which is actually our natural tendency. So we want to create a safe space within the body to be able to let those moods surface and process through. When we suppress an emotion versus letting it naturally surface to be processed through our body, a lot of biochemical factors come into play. I love the quote by St. Francis de Sales. He says, have patience with all things, but chiefly have patience with yourself. Do not lose courage in considering your own imperfections, but instantly set about remedying them. Every day, begin the task anew. Learn to help those emotions work through your body. 
Our imperfections might be biochemical. Our imperfections aren't necessarily character flaws as much as they are actual deficiencies in the body. So how do you know if you are in a false mood state or you're actually experiencing a true normal mood? If you are experiencing a sleep patterning that's not normal for you, if you're not sleeping well, you'll know that you're in a false mood state. If you're worrying too much, if you're easily irritated or angered, if you feel anxious or worried about the future, things that haven't happened yet. By the way, depression is a worry and preoccupation with the past and anxiety is a worry and preoccupation with the future. So both of those we cannot control, but when you're in a false mood state, you're not always rational. Actually, a lot of people we see in a false mood state are overly perfectionistic. Also, very critical. Critical of the self and others. False moods continuously contribute to low self-confidence. And oftentimes introversion, where we tend to withdraw socially, it's a natural aspect of not feeling like you're in a positive mood state. Easily overwhelmed where everyday little tiny stressors that normally wouldn't trigger you now all of a sudden feel like an elephant. Lack of ability to concentrate. And this is where more of those ADD symptoms would show up. As a life coach, I've had many clients I've worked with who falsely label themselves as their mood state. And that's a very, very dangerous road to be on. So if you do see yourself in any of those symptoms, don't label yourself. Just know that there's a biochemical reaction or imbalance going on and you need to fill up your reserves. So let's talk about how we can do that. Restocking and nourishing the brain physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Now, when we're talking about having balance or feeding the body in the right way, we know that we have an access to a full array of internal resources within us. We can go deeper with those emotional issues and really cleanse them out of the body. We're going to talk about ways that the essential oils are a very, very powerful tool and catalyst to be able to do that in a more expeditious manner. And also, when we're trying to heal, there's access to critical memories and things that we've stored in our body that we actually need to drum up, although unpleasant that they may be. But as we exercise, as we relax, as we de-stress, things like prayer, meditation, nourishing the physical, emotional, and spiritual self will give us the strength to face whatever lies ahead with a sense of humor and also a sense of perspective. I will tell you that self-awareness is completely foundational to this whole process. You have to know where you are and what you're feeling and what's surfacing to be able to know how to process it and get it out of the body, for one. And also, you need to engage in self-care. I cannot stress enough how important the act of self-nurturance is in being able to meet the needs of your body. So making necessary dietary and lifestyle changes make a world of difference in correcting your chemistry. In doTERRA, we have what's called a culture of wellness. While oils are our flagship product, we actually highly, highly advocate for self-care and wellness. And what's foundational to that, when we looked at, at Dr. Hill's wellness pyramid, is eating right. I cannot stress to you how important it is to be able to take into your body what will feed it sufficient chemicals. Now, you literally are what you eat, and everything that you take into your mouth has a direct impact on the way you feel. So this is where the lifestyle comes into effect. Now, we also have here exercise, moving the body. Our bodies are designed to be in motion and exercise actually increases endorphins in the body. Next, rest and manage stress. We wanna make sure that we're giving our body time to recharge and when we do that, it actually diminishes the stress levels and cortisol levels in our body. Toxicity, we wanna reduce that toxic load. We have more control over that than we think we do. These are all part of lifestyle things we have control over, things we choose. Now, when we're talking about healthcare, we also have our informed self-care and then our proactive medical care. So I like to say we wanna marry the medical and the self-care, 
not put one over the other, only that we are completely taking our health into our hands and empowering ourselves by making these dietary and lifestyle changes. Again, this is the whole crux of how our biochemistry is aligned within the body. Our lifelong vitality pack, we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this today, I just have to mention this, it is actually going to be part of a continuing ed class, lifelong vitality that you won't want to miss. Our Zeo Megas, now, you know, there's been books written by notable psychiatrists on the link between mood and the omega factor, meaning how much of the omega stores in your body are being utilized. We absolutely need to be supplementing with omegas, especially as it relates to mood. We have this Alpha CRS Plus, which is amazing for inflammation in the body, and also to feed and nourish those cells. All wellness begins at the cellular level, and that's where these bioavailable vitamins go. And then we're talking also about VMZ, which is our vitamin mineral supplements, which provides 72 trace organic minerals to feed that nutrition in the body. We're not getting enough minerals in our soil. We have to supplement. So if you're not under Terra's Lifelong Vitality, get on some kind of supplementation. Again, but I do highly recommend these. When we're talking about having nutritional deficiencies, we really need to emphasize how sudden and drastic a mood can change when those nutritional stores are not being fed the right way. Imagine a child who's just eaten like a cheese puff and there's all kinds of artificial flavorings and, and all kinds of things attached to that. And you can see how that child's mood changes so suddenly based on what he's put into his body. And the same is true for us. So if we're not feeding ourselves the right way to offset a lot of the stuff that's in the environment and chemicals that are put into our foods, we're going to experience that same market shift in our moods and behavior. I see a lot of people who are actually suffering from obesity who are starving. They're not getting the right minerals and nutrients. And the reason they are overweight is they're going to other food sources and empty caloric and empty uh, nutritional places to get those nutrients and they're not being fed. So interestingly enough, we can manage our weight as well as our moods. So another very important aspect of that nutritional absorption is through our digestive enzymes. We don't always eat a lot of live foods and so a lot of the enzymes are lacking in our diet. We eat a lot of protein, for example, but a lot of the amino acids in that protein, like tryptophan, can't be absorbed the right way and made bioavailable in the body to convert to serotonin, for example, which contributes to an elevated mood. Same is true for phenylalanine. It doesn't always convert to endorphins in the right way because we aren't absorbing those amino acids and utilizing the body the way that we could. So utilizing the terazyme for digestive purposes will contribute a great deal to an elevated mood and high energy levels. In understanding the need to make these vital amino acids more bioavailable, Laura Jacobs searched for an essential oil to assist in this process. She discovered ginger is the perfect partner for that. Not only is it famous for assisting in digestion, but it's effective also because it contains an upwards of 90% of sesquiterpenes and is well known for its capacity to oxygenate the brain. So what better oil to partner with for optimal brain chemistry? One of the most critical questions that are often asked are how does a prescription medication fare against sort of a natural medicinal component like essential oils? And what's important to realize that the essential oils are chemicals. They are and they have a very natural chemical profile. And if you look in your Modern Essentials book, you'll see some of this mapping that occurs naturally in these plant compounds. Now prescription medications are formulated to actually try to mimic what exists naturally in these plant compounds. And even if you alter one molecule or one atomic structure just a little bit and tweak it just a little bit, you're gonna have an entirely different chemical profile. What's nice about the essential oils is these plant compounds actually are restorative, they restore, whereas synthetic compounds alter, and that's the main difference. So when we're talking about synthetic compounds versus natural compounds, the major distinguisher here is that synthetic compounds are not capable of being selective, whereas natural compounds are selective. Antibiotics kill all bacteria, both good and bad. They're not selective. Same with chemotherapy. That's one of the reasons why synthetic compounds carry with them side effects, because they're not selective in what they kill versus restore. Whereas the natural is very efficacious at being able to keep the good and get rid of the bad. So it's naturally very selective and keeps that restoration intact for the healthy cellular functioning. Now, within the cell, 
as we know, cellular functioning is absolutely pivotal to mood and wellness begins at the cellular level. So we have to look at the cell. And we have these little receptor sites on the cell that basically take in information that's being sent to it. Messenger molecules called ligands come into these receptor sites and they carry information to the cell and the cell is able to intake and produce it, but these messages can be changed. And that's when we're talking about essential oils, what we're really saying is that these exogenous ligands, meaning these ligands that come from a source outside of the cell, can actually be something that alters the chemistry of the cell. Essential oils are exactly that. They're exogenous ligands that have the ability to change the messenger system within the cellular and the receptivity to go into the cell and be able to create a biochemical response. We learn emotionally. Our nose, and don't laugh at my nose, I'm not the art and the artist in the family, but inside our nasal cavities, way up into, there's two olfactory bulbs that sit at the base of our brain and go straight into the limbic system. And the limbic system is the area of the brain that houses emotion, stored memory. It's kind of responsible for how we walk through life and how we manage stress. When we smell an atom, excuse me, a molecule <laughs> from an essential oil and it goes up into that nasal cavity, hits that olfactory bulb and goes straight into the limbic system, it produces an immediate emotional response. It's akin to, um, for instance, snorting cocaine. I mean, that's why people snort cocaine because it's the fastest way to get up into the brain outside of intravenous injection. So aroma travels quickly and an unfiltered route up to that limbic system and produces again an immediate emotional response. We have more receptor cells within the limbic system than anywhere else in the body. So there is a very, very profound impact at the deepest levels on the body, emotions, and psyche. Referencing that whole ability of the essential oils and those order molecules of the essential oils to get up into that limbic system of the brain, we want to capitalize on that. We want to use that in helping with mood and having that instant response. So we want to talk about diffusing the oils. And that could look like putting them in your diffuser, but it could also actually look like just picking up the oil and actually smelling it right from the bottle so it can get an even more concentrated effect into the brain of those essential oil molecules. So it's going to activate physical responses in the body and trigger emotional responses. Also important in utilizing the essential oils for mood management and balance is to make sure that when you're putting them on the body for topical application, you're actually promoting a heat transfer and getting them into the muscle. There's an 80% greater absorption rate when you do so. You want to massage it into the tissues and have that heat transfer so that 80% of that oil can be absorbed in your body. Would you rather have 80% of that absorption loss through evaporation by not doing so? I don't think so. We also have the Aroma Touch technique, which is a really beautiful way to put the oils along the spine and on the feet, reducing inflammation and also providing homeostasis for the body. Let's now go into exactly which oils you use and for what purpose. When we're talking about that depressed state, hopeless, um, resigned, in despair, sort of that more detached state, we want to provide the body with chemicals that will help it become more buoyant, adaptable, and optimistic. Some of the essential oils that I have found to be very powerful for that, I've actually had an experience with Melissa, or as in more of a, a sadness or a despair state, I felt very kind of resigned and hopeless as I was falling asleep one night about an emotional issue I was dealing with. I put the Melissa on in key points, my temples, um, on the back of my neck and on my heart, and I actually was able to process through that night. I actually smelled Melissa on and off during the whole night. When I woke up in the morning, that issue felt like it had been lifted from me. So elevation, frankincense, Melissa, any citrus oil really is gonna be great for that buoyancy and bringing that optimistic quality back into the body chemistry. All right, another false mood state is really exacerbated by not getting adequate sleep. Poor sleep equals poor focus. There's a quote by Kathleen Nadu, who is a PhD, when you're tired, you're deprived of oxygen, which is necessary for the production of chemicals such as dopamine and adrenaline. Even one night of tossing and turning can give you symptoms that resemble ADHD, such as forgetfulness and difficulty maintaining concentration. I don't know about you, 
But when I don't have a great night's sleep, I really feel it the next day. I don't feel on top of my game. I feel chemically different and I am chemically different. We also have this other component to our mood states where we want to, to receive a more calming, more grounding in the body. We're talking about anxiety, phobias, um, irrational fears, worry, obsessive states. And so addressing sleep and calm, actually the same receptor sites and the same chemicals address both of those issues. When we use essential oils to address sleep, it's automatically going to address the calming issue as well. So oils that would be indicated for that would be the Peaceful Child blend, which is a recipe I'll share with you a little later on. Vetiver and lavender together. Vetiver has been indicated in, in many studies for ADHD. Roman chamomile, a beautiful, beautiful oil for the body for calming. So if you're not using that one, it's a little lesser known. Great, great oil for inducing those calming states. You know, attention deficit disorders are on the rise. As many as 20% of school-age children exhibit these kind of ADHD, ADD behavior patternings. Over the last 10 years, the average attention span dropped from 12 minutes to a short five minutes. Now with focus, there are some really powerful oils that are indicated to be very, very effective for helping with attention span, apathy, depression, um, lack of drive, lack of focus, all of those things. Vetiver was found to be the most effective um, observations in brainwave scans and things of that nature in 100% of the subjects that were tested. So if you pair vetiver and lavender together, that calming is even more enhanced. That synergy of those two oils together is very, very powerful. So great, great benefit. You know, with concentration, we're talking, I always say, again, put the oil where it hurts. If we need more focus and concentration, we're gonna concentrate on putting the oils applications into the places where that would be indicated. Um, for emotional upsets and hurts, heart, stomach, wherever you're feeling it in the body. So just keep that as a general rule of where to put the oils. And also when you're seeing lemongrass and cloves together in a lot of these things, it's because they really affect thyroid functioning, which is indicated for that focus and attention. Now remember, great thing to keep in mind is oxygen equals energy. So when you're oxygenating the body, you're actually rejuvenating the body and giving it more vitality. So just one quick burst of aerobic exercise can improve concentration and flood the brain with oxygen and activate those brain chemicals like dopamine. Low energy is one of the top health concerns that people have and it's especially prevalent in those who are experiencing that low vibration mode or false mood state. Your adrenal glands are really tied in to what kind of energy level you have. Um, if you're experiencing being a little bit more high strung, more wound up, mental chatter, voices in your head, burnout, exhaustion, all that kind of thing, lack of short term memory, you really want to look at how you can improve your body chemistry and really looking at the adrenals being a major support system for that. So basil and rosemary are two very powerful oils that are indicated for adrenal support. When your heart is really just no longer in it, when you're feeling a little disconnected from that heart space, not really feeling, you know, just like you're all in, geranium and ylang ylang are great for that. They're great for the heart. They're great for projecting that heart space and really getting you um, tuned in to what you're feeling here and being more engaged. And then when we've also, again, talked about oxygenation and how that energizes the cell, Cypress is really great for circulation. Frankincense is really great as well for inflammation. They both are. But also citrus bliss because citrus bliss, again, any of those citrus oils are really going to be great for enlivening the mind and lifting the body up. Now, another thing that we need to keep in mind are our cortisol levels. If our cortisol levels are too high, we're going to have things like blood sugar imbalances, um, abdominal fat, weight gain, things like that. If our, if our cortisol levels are too low, that's where we get that lack of being able to recover from illness and not really being able to, you know, get over those chronic health conditions and disease states. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we're finding that when people are trying to actually be in a place of being able to cope, they're a lot of times disconnecting, again, when their biochemistry is low and they're not being fed the right way, and they're in that false mood state where they're crying easily, not getting over things, not getting over issues. Maybe there's a loss or a situational issue like death or something where there's some grief going on. What they're really experiencing is a, a diminishment of endorphins in the body. So what we wanna do is increase the endorphins, that's actually the feel-good chemical in the body. 
And we see a lot of people who are like thrill seeking, you know, always up for a challenge. It's because they're, they're really low in endorphins and they're trying to boost themselves up. And so they're doing these really dramatic things to be able to feel better. And actually they're trying to get away from pain. We want to avoid pain at all costs. So where the essential oils are indicated for this emotional state here are the analgesics like deep blue, helichrysum, wintergreen, clove, and eucalyptus. And you also need, you know, when you're trying to up your endorphins and you're actually trying to feed that biochemistry to lift it up, you need to get up some, a little bit of that gumption or that little, mm, just that little thing that takes you to that next place in your life. And so some, a couple of oils that are indicated for that are cassia and ginger. And then of course, bergamot, which we talked about before, which is really helpful with your sense of self. And then with your heart, okay, we talked about the heart a lot, of course, when we're talking about emotional states, but a lot of people who are experiencing that broken heart state, really feeling discouraged, like really, again, that their heart's just not in it anymore. Lime, geranium, and ylang, ylang. We already talked about geranium and ylang, ylang, but especially when we're talking about things like grief and low coping, we really want to engage the heart again and lift up that heart space to be able to function and thrive, not just survive. All right, and last, I want to really just kind of share with you a blend that I kind of referenced on and off throughout this presentation, the Peaceful Child blend, and that we have to give credit to Deborah Gardner, who has actually been the one to formulate this and put this together. But this is a wonderful, wonderful blend for bringing you to all of those restorative places that we were talking about, calming the mind from chatter, um, nourishing and protecting the brain and nervous system, and um, more of that sedative effect on the body and calming, soothing and stabilizing and balancing the body. I love this. I actually put this in a little roll bottle that I got roller bottle that I got from Aroma Tools and I actually put it on my 10 year old son's spine every single night. He actually asks me for it and I know that it's because he needs it and he sees the value in and it helps him to come to a state of calming and promote sleep for him. So you can find this recipe on your tear pad and it's amazing. The key component in this is actually vetiver. It's got more vetiver in it than any other essential oil. And we've already talked about the benefits of vetiver on calming, and especially in children. But adults can use Peaceful Child as well. I use Peaceful Child. I know a lot of my clients use it and some people in my doTERRA organization are finding great results for adults with anxiety and who are needing a little bit more help with ha calming um, anxious states in the body and coming to a state of balance. Now, for those of you who have not taken advantage of our loyalty rewards program, I would really encourage you to look at it. It's the, most, it's the smartest way to get oils and it's the smartest way to build your natural home pharmacy. As I've been sharing this presentation, you probably noticed some oils that are indicated for something that maybe you're struggling with or a loved one in your, close to you is struggling with. Uh, the best way to build those stores and to get those oils and receive product credit points for those is to go on our loyalty rewards program. Now, you, we also have a program called the Product of the Month Club. If you have your loyalty rewards set for 125 PV and it goes out on or before the 15th of the month, you're gonna get another free oil. Last month it was balance, which as we know, we've heard about the benefits of balance today. So just remember that if you're going to build a natural home pharmacy and slowly build your oil supply over time, this is absolutely the smartest way to do that. So in conclusion, I, I mean, I have shared a whole bunch of scientific information with you, a lot of stuff that, you know, maybe is new to you, but I really want to end this with sharing from my heart to yours about how I know and feel all of those self-nurturing practices really are the catalyst that's going to take you to that next level in your healing. And we're not saying that this is a cure-all, but we are saying that when you advocate for yourself and experience those authentic emotions and not continue to repress those false emotions, you are going to notice a marked shift in how you feel and how you process and walk through life. And I, this really does hit really, really close to home because I actually lost my sister Shauna to suicide. This is a picture of her. Uh, we're only two years apart and it's become a family mission of ours to be able to find ways to um, self-advocate, self-nurture, take care of ourselves. My sister was in a false mood for state for so long and didn't really understand really what was happening to her biochemically, but she descended very, very quickly. And as a family, this is actually a picture of my sisters and I and my mom, uh, the women in our family have banded together, and Shauna is actually included in this right here, to try to create new awareness and both within our immediate families and then outward. 
So one of the reasons that I am so strong and passionate about sharing this message is because I have seen how it's affected my own personal family members and uh, relatives very close to me who have actually been able to break free of those chains, not only of addiction, but also of depression and feeling listless and passionless in life. Remember, it's up to you to take care of you. You are the only one that can take care of you the right way. If you're waiting for a doctor to come around or a spouse or a loved one or a best friend or a parent, they aren't gonna be able to nurture you at the level that you can nurture you. So advocate for yourself and take that time to nourish yourself constantly, nutritionally and biochemically, and you will notice a very, very marked shift in the way that you feel. Thank you.